found out about it, and I asked my father, who was a farmer, to drive me there. And he did, which was a big sacrifice on his part. My father farmed the native way, which means he used mules and plows. Um, and it was a big sacrifice for him to take off a half a day to take me. But he did. And I can tell you, the feeling of walking into that bookmobile is with me today and will be with me until I die. Uh, walking in and seeing all those books and knowing they were mine. Uh, was an amazing, amazing feeling. And um, the librarian came over to me, because I'm sure I'm standing there with my mouth open, uh, and she knew that I needed help, and she put me in touch with knowledge. And from that day forward, I knew that's exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to help people have access to information and help them find that information that they needed. My second uh, revealing experience came when I was in high school and we had a new English teacher who decided the school needed a library. And we did because there still wasn't one in town. It was a far drive to go to the county seat, which had a library by then. And so she asked me if I would help her put together a library. And I can tell you no moment in my library work has been more satisfying than gluing pockets into those books. Uh, it was exciting uh, cataloging those books. And how did we catalog? This one was fiction, this one was nonfiction, this one started, the author's last name started with an A, so it went first. So it was a pretty simple system. But when the students started coming in and checking out those books, it was an aha moment for me. And from there on, I knew there was only one thing I wanted to be, and that was to, to work in libraries. And I did. Uh, but as a young adult, uh, I moved around a lot. And what I found was, every time I moved, I started at the bottom of that career ladder again. So I have worked in uh, public libraries. I've, worked, I've done volunteer work uh, as an adult in school libraries for my children. I've worked in military and special. Uh, and academic libraries, uh, and I love them all. There's a lot of similarities, a lot of differences, uh, but they all meant the same thing to me, and I, I love them. But every library, no matter which one it was, it was back down, back to that very beginning place again. And I knew the only way I was gonna break that pattern is if I went to college and got a degree, which I did, and I was the first one in my family uh, to get a college degree. And I then went on to library school at Indiana University and got a library science degree. And my first job after that was at Indiana State University because my husband worked at Indiana University and I knew we were going to be staying in Indiana so I needed to get some place that was close enough to commute. Uh, it was a 60 mile commute each direction so I'm not sure how drivable it actually was. And, and I told someone if anybody ever, I had to take Highway 46 for those who've ever been in Indiana. Uh, it's a two lane road and if anybody had ever said to me again, what a beautiful drive, uh, I think I would have beamed them because it, it was pretty for the first two weeks. At the end of six years, it was not very pretty. And then we moved to Terre Haute and it was a lot easier from there. But anyway, so I started at Indiana State University as uh, head of circulation. That was a position that I had held in other as a staff, and again, I had worked in, I think, every department in the library except special collections, which I've not worked there. And I've worked in technical services, I've worked in public services, I've worked as student, clerical, professional, faculty, administrator, volunteer, student, uh, the whole gamut. And one of the things that I found when I got to Indiana State University was that I no longer had to worry about that glass ceiling uh, because from ha not having a, a degree. Because having a degree, having that library science degree made all the difference. So those of you who are thinking about going into administration, I know in some positions you don't need it, but I do encourage you to really think about getting that master's degree in library science. It will take you places that you cannot go sound like Dr. Seuss, all oh, the places you can go. Um, but it will take you places that you cannot go without it. And so please think hard about it. And if you do go, think about making that a double major because that will help you out tremendously as well. So anyway, so I was at Indiana State University. 
uh, the university had just come out of a very, or the state had just come out of a very a bad recession, 2008, 2009, and we were doing very well. The library was doing very well. Things were turning around. I had uh, become a full professor or full librarian at Indiana State and uh, really quite happy there. But I knew if I wanted to continue up that career path, that career ladder, that it was time to move on. It was at that time in my life that if I was going to move, it was a time to do it. But I really didn't know where I wanted to go until I saw the ad for the University of Utah. And quite frankly, it was the only place. There were a lot of, there's a lot of turnover in uh, libraries right now in upper administration because we're an aging population, uh, librarians, and there's a lot of movement. But none of the other places that I saw that were open interested me. And so why did Utah interest me? Well, it's not because I knew anybody here, because I didn't, uh, but my husband is a geologist and we'd been here for a couple of conferences and <clears throat> we'd tacked on vacations and we'd hiked all the national parks. Growing up in Oklahoma and then living in Indiana, I was very attracted to the beautiful scenery here, the mountains, the people. Uh, we both had just fallen in love with it, and so I jumped at the chance to be able to come here. And uh, the rest, they say, as they say, is sort of history. So I came here, and that's how I got to be where I am. You each have your own st your own stories, and I hope you'll think about them. Um, oh, I didn't. Sorry. So what does that mean for you? So you're wanting to go up the career pet ladder. What does that mean? Where are you going? How do you get there? One of the first things you need to do is to talk to your dean or your director or the person to whom you report and tell them that you want to move on, that you, want, you have aspirations to be uh, a, a manager or an administrator and ask them how do they get to where they are what advice would they give you because you're gonna because while you're asking their advice you're also saying I want to move on and you're giving them the opportunity to help you and as an administrator I can tell you there is nothing that brings me greater pleasure than to be able to help people move on in their careers I have several people who I've worked with in the past that I mentor and put them in contact. Uh, I, I, I get phone calls, I would guess, at least three times a month from search firms looking for that right person. And there is, again, what I was saying earlier, there is such a turnover in libraries that if you want to go into administration, you are in the right, you are in the, living in the right time because there are, there's going to be a huge turnover uh, in libraries in the, in the next five years. So the other thing that you might consider is what kind of programs, and here you are, you're in a program like that. So you're already taking that first step. You're already working towards making those changes in your life. Think of other programs as well. Uh, there's the HERS Institute, which is a great program if you're uh, a woman wanting to go into academic librarianship. There's a Harvard uh, library, the Library Institute, which is a great one to go to uh, as well. Think about those things. Maybe your library will invest in you, and if they don't, invest in yourself. Take that time and the money and do it. It looks great on your resume, and you're going to meet a lot of interesting people. So what can you do to make sure that your manager knows uh, that you're a good employee? You know, you, maybe you work in a small place, maybe it's easier to get attention. Maybe you work in a larger place and it's more difficult. Either way, what can you do? So I asked my associate deans, what would you suggest? So here's some of the things that we came up with. So serve on committees. It sounds like an easy thing to do, but I can tell you committee work can be very taxing. And even better, volunteer to be the chair of that committee because that's where you really start getting a leadership role. One of my ADs said, when I see a staff member successfully chairing a committee, I think to myself, there's someone whose leadership skills we need to tap more consistently. Lead projects and teams and go above and beyond expectations. When you take on a project and you're asked to do this much, don't just do this much, do that much. 
And always, always, when you get thanked, share that thanks. Always make sure that you include the people who, have, who are working with you. Because not only is that the right thing to do, but that really shows the kind of leadership, the kind of leader that you're going to be. Uh, balance what you think is the right direction and the direction your library is going. Be vocal in stating what you think, but be able to move forward in a new direction. I can tell you as an administrator, for every problem that we're trying to solve, there's a hundred different solutions uh, offered by people. And there's no way to do all those solutions. So when you see, you offer your solution and it's not the one that's accepted, get on board with the solution that is. Be a team player because that is something that administrators, your managers, uh, your directors are going to really appreciate. So as you aspire to move into administration, how can you prepare for that role? First of all, look in the mirror. See somebody else there. See yourself, but see yourself in a new role. You have to start thinking in terms of campus priorities or in terms of your library's priorities. If you're in a public library, what does that library mean to your city? If you're in a school library, what does that school library mean to your students and your parents and to the larger community? You have to start thinking big. You can no longer just think about your own unit, about how you uh, are situated in that unit. You have to think about how you're situated in the bigger picture. When you think about how people are hired in the library. The dean or the director is the only person in the library that's usually not hired in the same manner that everybody else is hired in. You're going to be you're going to be reviewed and um, interviewed by the board of trustees, by the provost, by the school board. So you have to start thinking about things differently. Again, make sure you're looking at the big picture. So as an example, when I prepared for my interview here at the university, I read about campus priorities. I became familiar with the colleges and their goals. I looked at the state of Utah's educational aspirations, and I looked for where did I see opportunities? Where was the intersection of all those things? What might that mean for the library? And how might they move forward to meet those needs? Another way to, to think is you need to start networking. You need to build up a networking base. So when you travel to conferences, it's not enough to just go to the talks or give a talk. You need to network. Don't sit by the person you know. Sit with the people you don't know. Get out of your comfort zone, and that's not always easy. Uh, when you come back from a con when you go to a conference, make a promise to yourself. I'm going to come back with the business cards of three people who I don't know right now, and I'm going to keep in contact with them because you never know when those people when you can. Uh, contact them and do a project with them or when someone in their library or maybe they themselves are going to be hiring somebody and you're going to be the person who they can then reach out to because they know you. Also you need to find a mentor. If, as you move forward uh, in your goals, find a mentor. Find someone who you can relate to. Make this someone you picked. A lot of times when we start new jobs, we have mentors assigned to us, and that's great. But find your own mentor. Find somebody who you can connect with, who's been there and done what, what you want to do, and pick their brains and, and get insight from them, because they can be really, really helpful. And they can connect you to people as well. They can help you uh, in the future. So I wanted to talk a little, just a minute, about what the literature says. What does the literature say about um, becoming a leader? Well, from the Library Journal, someone asked, what do you need to learn to be an administrator? And their answer was, it's endless. From the Chronicles of Higher Education, someone asked, how do I know if it's my turn to move into an administrative position? And the answer was, if you wait until you're ready to be an administrator, you will never become one. No one enters this job completely prepared, no matter how confident someone may seem. It's like everything else in life. You start where you are, you learn by trial and error, you improve as you move along, 
and you discover things while practicing the trade. And that's very true. The late Thomas Sir Giovanni said, effective leadership takes three things, the head, the heart, and the hand. All three of these are important, but the difference between a mediocre administrator and a great one is primarily a matter of the heart, or dispositions as he called it, or as we might call character. Certain core characteristics are at the heart of good leadership. Knowledge and skill can improve rapidly for the rookie leader. Character, however, is more difficult to change and improve upon as it emanates from our most deeply held values and beliefs. And here you see the kinds of things that I look for when I am looking for someone to be a leader. To be trustworthy and to be trusting means not only are you trustworthy, but that you trust other people. To be collaborative, consistent, energetic, optimistic, to be a risk taker, to be intelligent, to be joyful, to be an advocate for your staff, to be a, uh, and to be honest. And if you have those characteristics, and you can answer yes to these questions, indicators are that you're ready to be a leader. If you are willing to work long hours with little time off, to work evenings and weekends, if you can balance ego with humanity and humility, if you can accept and learn from criticism, if you believe in the people that you lead, if you believe that reasonable people with the reasonable information will make reasonable decisions, if you can listen to diverse viewpoints, finding common ground on most issues and seeing the big picture, if you understand that good relationships Effective teams and shared responsibilities are the pathways to important accomplishments. And if you feel you're ready for a challenge, I'd say you're ready to be a leader. Thank you. All right, and I understand we're gonna, we're gonna wait a minute for questions. So I wanted to leave you with this. So wherever your pathway takes you, I hope you find it very sweet. And over on the table, I, have, I brought my handouts. And if you will help yourself to one before you leave, it's a candy bar. Wow. <laughs> Thank you very much. These two are going to fit together very, very well. Jamie Carter is going to be talking about leadership, and it's very nice to have the incoming president of the Utah Library Association on our edition for today. And I have to say, the first time I met Jamie is when she worked for the State Library. She actually used to be in only books, and she started out as a commission on the whole day, and she became excited all the time. She thought it was interesting, but she could probably do the driver's job, but she did. <laughs> she became a librarian and another bookmobile and did that just beautifully and then from there it's on to be the director of two of public library. I feel like we've got an investment in me and I'm very glad to see her moving up and sharing what she's been doing as far as leadership. And not experienced at the microphone. <laughs> a son who's into theatrics that she just I've never met Jamie and not heard something about her son. Yeah. <laughs> the other one jumps out of airplanes and blows up bridges. So it's hard for me to say that out loud and not tear up a little bit. Um, he, he won't get on a roller coaster at Lagoon, but he really likes to jump out of airplanes and blow stuff up. So, so I do have two kiddos. Um, so Alberta and I have different, different stories, um, but we have very similar principles in our approaches. And we had a great conversation on the phone. Um, I didn't, I frankly didn't want to hang up, but I know she has several, you know, people stacked behind me every time we, we would be able to talk. So, um, so with, with Donna's introduction, I did start in, in Bookmobile. Um, but a little further back than that, I was in college and I was going to study medicine. I was going to cure something really amazing like something so great I it might I might even invent it just to cure it I don't know but I knew I was gonna do this so I went to school and that meant I was gonna be in a lab now who if anybody's met me like picture me in a lab 
<laughs> talking to the germs, whatever I'm growing, you know. Um, I, I quickly, when I, I talked my way into an advanced anatomy class. Also something you can probably imagine. Um, because I wanted to get started and I, I wanted to be done tomorrow, so I needed to do that right now. And the, the head of the department allowed me to do that. So I, I talked myself into this class. It's way over my head, hardest class I've ever taken. He asked me, what do you want to do? And I told him. And he said, huh. So last week, <laughs> you came in and volunteered for extra lab time because you like it. And I saw you almost crawl into a cadaver, like crawl in it. Because you were like, look, look at this. It's right here and it just runs. It's amazing. Look at our, and he said, you were teaching those people in that room and you were so excited. You didn't even know you were in like a cadaver. <laughs> so um, I hadn't thought much about that until I got into libraries. Um, I went on to work in human resources for six years. Um, I was an accountant for an engineering and a surveying firm um, for six year, for one year. And then um, tried to be, the state of Utah tried to recruit me for a position with water rights because that was really exciting. But it was stable pay, great benefits. I had two little kids. Um, I, I thought that was the way to go. And I knew from all my experience in HR that it's better to apply for more than one job at the same time. So I applied to be also a bookmobile te technician. Also state of Utah, same tier on the pay schedule. Much more difficult. Um, so I knew if I was offered that job, I was probably gonna turn it down, but best practices in HR, do what you're supposed to do. So I applied and I was offered the position. I knew if I took that position in Bookmobile, when you're a technician, you catalog the books, you're the first person that everybody sees, you're the last person that everybody sees. You also clean the bathrooms, you shovel the walks, and if you are sick, you have to call around your community to assist you with a volunteer to run the library for the day. And I could not quit thinking about this library that I had been in once, didn't even know it was there before I applied. Um, it was in a little piece of the Enoch City Hall. Um, I, I just, and I cannot imagine my life different than it is now. I was offered both positions, and I took the, the harder of the two. So um, my education has not been formal. I do not have an MLS. Um, in fact, if I was able to go back to school right now, I would go get my MPA, because I feel like that would better serve my staff and the position that I'm in now. So I want to look at leadership from a different perspective. Um, and before we're done here, and I'm going to ask you to, to keep me posted on time, um, before we're done here, what I want to do is look at this at a different perspective with all of you, and then um, explore one method that I use that is self-directed and it's continuous because I've had to learn on the fly. I've learned from lots and lots and lots of mistakes. I have two staff members in this cohort and bless their hearts, they're not like, yes, she does mistake a lot, but she, I, they're kind, so they're, they're just giggling. All right, um, so I gave you each a handout and I only want you to take three minutes. The things that are on this handout that I want you to address um, first of all, I want these responses to be from your personal preferences. I know you've all been in leadership trainings where attributes of positive leaders are thrown up on a chart. I've been in a million of them, um, and it's always valuable. But what I want you to do is talk through your personal preferences. Um, so it should have a red bar at the top that says moving up the ladder of librarianship. I want you to list just some things in three minutes how you want or prefer to be led, 
What do you want your supervisors or organizational management to do with you, for you, for your organization? I also want you to think about the negative ways that you've been led um, and what, your, what you wish your supervisor, past or present, wouldn't do. So we're gonna take three minutes to do that and then we'll come back to that in a minute.